Okay, you'll love this. This happened just today. I was working with my client and I asked him, you know, how was your week going? He said, oh, it's been it's been pretty tough. I don't know what happened. Like on Tuesday, I just got this like kind of panic attack and my I felt like my business was failing and my relationships weren't working and I felt super fat all day. And I was like, wait a second, I recognize that. And so I asked him, like, did you have any sugar? He was like, no, I've been eating really well. I didn't have any sugar. And then he goes, well, wait a second. No, Monday night was Halloween. I had sugar. I had Halloween candy on Monday night. And I was like, I knew it. That is the same way my brain works if I get sugar. Anxiety through the roof. Yes. I hate yes. it. Not worth it. No, and this is where, you know, people get so disempowered, Casey, because, you know, the the connection is, as we said earlier, it's ignored, right? Don't ever, ever underestimate the power of poor nutrition on your brain and how it then reacts in your body. It's very, very powerful, but powerful in the wrong way versus say, for example, what we were talking about before being in ketosis state and your brain running on ketones, that's a whole different power, right? So again, the empowerment of that is for him to understand, whoa, what happened for me when I chose to do that. So again, I always make sure people understand this is not about a cheat day. And again, moderation, balance and cheat days are all BS. So don't get into the language patterning of cheat days or I fell off the bandwagon. No, no, no. We choose to do it because choosing is far more empowering. But then when we actually get the feedback from our body, and this is the other thing, when people are low carb or into a carnival way of eating, and it normally happens within a three week period where everything starts to shift for most people, they understand the feedback that they can really actually go, hold on, I'm having a real marketed effect here on my mental and physical health. And once people actually understand the feedback, they're like, that's just not worth it for me. Yeah. I find that, 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 that explanation explains why so many people self correct on carnivore. They like, they, they just end up feeling so much better and it's easier and easier for them to stay carnivore over time because they're noticing the benefits and also noticing the opposite effect of when they have something that you choose something i love the way you frame that they choose something that makes them feel terrible it's not worth feeling terrible correct and you know i always even kind of err on the side of caution when i even use the word carnival diet right because diet again is associated with past patterning when you know most people go on a diet and they'll the, the unconscious goes back to the memory bank of all the times we went on a diet and we go in with the wrong mindset because we've got to be really mindful of words have actions which have unconscious consequences of past memories or past things that we have done. So I'll always use the fact that carnivore is a species appropriate way of eating and it's a lifestyle way of eating. It's not a diet because once you take out that word, again, the mind's like, well, I've never done that before. That's a little bit unknown for me. And that's where people then start to understand the connection between the known and the unknown. We don't want to create in the known because that's a series of everything in the past. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I could be, I could be a lot more mindful about that myself when I'm talking about the carnivore diet and, and, and just talk about like that species appropriate diet, the way that you talk about. Now, one thing that gets a bit tricky when you're talking about people who you're right, like are addicted, we kind of think of being addicted as like, well, you have really low willpower. You need to increase your willpower and try harder mm -hmm. to get away from these foods. And I, I think that's kind of a mistake in my experience, but you, you do this. So tell us a little bit about the, the kind of myths or truths behind willpower. Well, it, it's a myth. It, it just doesn't work, you know, especially if someone's addicted to hyper-processed foods, right? So again, I hear it all the time, like, I just can't do this. Like, there must be something wrong with me. And then, then they feel bad because they don't have the willpower or someone externally has said to them, like, just use willpower, right? And it's like, have you ever tried to tell a drug addict used willpower to get off heroin or cocaine? No. Food, hyper-processed foods, Food like substances are addictive, literally the same mechanism, same chemical reaction. So that's why willpower doesn't work. What does work is educating someone on 
this is what your mind's doing. This is what the dopamine's doing. This is what's happening in your taste buds. But also too, Casey, another side of that is the connection and the emotional attachment to those foods. And the resistance for people to understand if they've come from a big diet mentality, they're like, oh, I can't have that. So every single time they go into that default method of, oh my gosh, I've done this 20,000 times before and it's never worked. Of course it didn't work because you're addicted. <laughs> We've got to get rid of that and actually get the body back into another process of elimination, ground set, like ground reset root cause and give people the tools yeah. not a meal plan hmm. that's so interesting I, I, i've been really curious to ask you this question a lot of my nutrition coaching certifications have a, a very high amount i would say of behavior modification strategies so before we have you count things or track things or whatever we're going to see you know checking in with yourself how are you feeling let's talk about your emotions around food let's let's yes. um you know I don't know. There was just a lot of tools and tricks and I thought they were helpful, but at the same time, it also kind of felt like we were just like spinning around with a bunch of like kind of techniques that never really got somebody in properly. And I think that the people who just say like, look, like the people you said earlier, I'm sick of being sick. I feel terrible. I'll go eat a diet. Now it almost seems like the brain starts to fix and you almost don't need to use as many of those kinds of tools to really help people along. What do you think about that? Honest question. Yeah, it, it, it really is true. I see it all the time. So this is why people, when they, they come to me, they're like, oh my gosh, I've never heard of doing that. Like actually, you know, let's treat the body. Let's get the body at a full, you know, nutritionally dense, you know, way of eating. And then all of a sudden, you know, 50%, a lot of the time, they're thinking and their, their, their symptoms start to lower or disappear. And they're like, what? I've been talking about that story for 10 years in therapy. And all of a sudden now it doesn't really matter. <laughs> right. And it's like, true. But one of the biggest things is going back to understand how do we learn what food is, right? So if we go back to how our minds actually um, and our brains program ourselves, because we're also, most people are in a waking state of hypnosis every single day. Up to 90% of what most people do is based on automatic pilot programming mode that we learnt between the age of zero to seven. So a lot of the time they're redundant, false beliefs, values that are not ours. However, the unconsciousness, so for example, if you think about your head as a video camera as a kid, you record everything, visually, auditory, sound, smell, energy. Also too, humans are energy, right? We absorb everything. Now, as a child, you don't have the analytical ability until the age of 12 to 13 to start to question, which is what I call the analytical questioning part of our mind. Prior to that, we are in what I call a pre-cognitive phase between zero to seven. Anyone in authority to you is basically where you learn from. <clears throat> so they're your source of, for example, most mums have probably been on a diet all of their lives, right? So as a kid, you see that patterning behavior and that's where your visualization of food comes from. Secondly, when you sit down at the table <clears throat> and you're told you've got to eat all of that because you don't get your dessert or you don't get your treat until you eat that, right? Now, trying to shove a bit of broccoli into a kid, if you watch a kid eat a bit of broccoli, <clears throat> they don't want to eat it. But, you know, as humans, we've been programmed to shove that vegetable into that kid. But if you give them a piece of meat, I'll guarantee you they'll down that without an issue. Why is that? It's an innate ability of instinct. So we've, we've, we move people away from instincts quite quickly as kids, right? But again, if you fall over and you cry, oh, here's a lollipop, stop crying. Food has always been used as treats generally or as a punishment. So the connection between what food is, is a very, very slippery slope. But again, we also develop a very poor and conflicted self-image because most people in authority to us pretty much have the same thing wow 
how challenging is that to unwind with people? And, and again, what's, how do you balance, you know, eating properly and eating animal based with all the techniques that you practice and teaching people how the mind works? How do you balance all of that? Yeah. So it's a, it's a very clear structure, but again, it depends, you know, when I'm talking to people, people have their own unique way of processing. So for example, it's about allowing people to understand that your mind will always stay in the known, right? Because it loves familiarity and it's kind of trying to protect you, right? So again, it's it's like a little vortex around you of all the patterning and programming that you've learned as a kid, which isn't yours. So again, as an adult, we grow up and we're like, hold on, something seems in conflict here. And we get into this thing, what I call self-image conflict, because we've got this patterning of everything outside of us, which is externalized, right? So most human beings, Casey, are also uh, conditioned and programmed to validate themselves externally through other people's thoughts, feelings, and reactions. We're never taught how to actually validate our own thoughts, feelings, and reactions within ourselves. We don't have a 99% of people (laughs) don't have a relationship with themselves mentally and physically until we disrupt the pattern. And I allow people to understand what things look like, sound like, feel like, and get them out of unconscious past patterning into the gap and the space between conscious and unconscious. And that's where the changes happen, but it's unknown. And most people, when we talk about the unknown, it's very fearful because the body will automatically and brain and mind will automatically try to jump back into the known. So most people look at their future. It will be a replication of their past. And a lot of the time that doesn't look too good for most people. 